Hey, uh, Mr. Parker here for week 45. I'm going to start this out with some information about a contest you guys can uh, enter over at the Screaming Toilet uh, website. Uh, there'll be a link below. It's right on the top. Uh, the prize is great. It's right up here. You can see it. It is a, a Arrow Edition of Basket Case. There's actually two possible winners here, and you get the enamel pin. Uh, it's a great release. I reviewed it last week. So if you're interested in winning a basket case, all you have to do is follow the link. It's not the same way to enter a contest. It's a little bit different. So you follow that link, you click on it, you'll see the picture of the basket case. You click that, you'll enter your name and your uh, email address and put your address in the description box. Foreign, uh, foreign people, uh, overseas uh, people are uh, welcome to enter as well. Basically, your email is going to be sent. You sometimes you'll get uh, you know some advertisements for cult movies and uh, books and stuff like that. Stuff uh, you probably are interested in. All you got to do is just enter your email uh, over there on that link, and you have a chance to win the uh, deluxe, awesome Arrow edition of Basket Case, brand new. So I think that's a pretty good deal. So uh, there's going to be contests like this all the time. That's how uh, we're going to do contests. Screaming Toys going to do contests. I'm going to do contests. So there'll be dual contest. Uh, also, um, I wanted to talk about, uh, what else? Uh, my Twitter and Instagram. I do have those. If you do want to follow me, it would be greatly appreciated. I don't, I'm not really big on Twitter yet. I, I mean, I, yeah, I mean like, yeah, I'm going to grow in numbers. I mean, I don't really use it as much as I'd like to. I'm kind of learning how to use it. You know, I'm a little older than a lot of you guys probably. So I don't know how the, how the Twitters work, how the tweets work. Uh, also Instagram. I love that. I love posting pictures on there. So follow me on there. Um, also, if you guys don't know, the Screaming Toilet page, uh, the link below, um, has a bunch of uh, you know uh, written reviews. A lot of times for like some of the other like Synapse and stuff and the Mono Macabre, I'll write written reviews. So if you want to check those out, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, if you have any questions about the contest, how to enter it, leave a message on the Screaming Toilet uh, uh, Facebook page asking me, ask me uh, directly on Facebook, on YouTube. I'll answer you. I'll send you the link. I'll get you straightened out where you go to enter. Okay. Um, also, uh, I want to mention that Killjoy from Necrophagia died. You know, I it wasn't. Uh, I, I knew him from like the August Underground Mortem's movie, uh, Mortem movie. He was in that, and uh, I, I watched some of his music. I actually had the DVD with a lot of his music videos directed by Jim Van Beber. So R.I.P. He was a regular Wasteland attendee. I, uh, attendee. I seen him there all the time. So uh, R.I.P. Hope you're in a better place. Um, also want to start this out with mentioning a bunch of campaigns that are going. I've never seen so many uh, independent campaigns going. Uh, first, we have the Batman, which I'm a part of. I, I should mention it. You know, I think that uh, Scott Shermer and all the actors in it did a great job. Jason Crow, Ellie Church, Arthur Culliper, who uh, they all they put their heart and soul into the movie, and so did Scott. It, it was a hard shoot. It's not over, and uh, he's securing funding for the second half of it. Uh, that is a, a Kickstarter. There's also another Kickstarter. Uh, Jim Van Beber is uh, collecting money to shoot. Uh, um, uh, uh, kind of a fight scene for a possible sequel to da, uh, Deadbeat at Dawn, which I love. It's going to be called uh, Day of the Deadbeat. So if you're interested in that, there'll be links below. And then there's a bunch of Indiegogos. There's the third uh, for Descort Service 3 called Taste Me uh, by Sean Donahue. That should be extra sleazy. And then there's a Don't Fuck in the Woods 2 campaign going. I know that uh, Kayla Elizabeth's going to be in that and uh, Kenzie... Um, uh, Phillips, I believe it is their last name, but uh, they're both actresses I worked with. They're both good people, so if you're interested in seeing them act. Uh, then there's also a freaking, I'm, I'm double checking, I don't miss anything. There's a Flowers 2 campaign going by Phil Stevens. Flowers is crazy. It was released by Under Earth. There's an uh, Indiegogo going for that. So there's a bunch of stuff going on if you're interested in the underground horror movies and stuff and you want to donate to kick Indiegogos or Kickstarters. Or if you just want me to shut up, there's timestamps to jump around uh, so you don't have to listen to any of this. You can go right into the reviews. Uh, uh, the first review I'm actually going to do uh, today is from Mondo Macabro. It is The Blood Spattered Bride. Not to be confused with the title Blood Splattered. Spattered. 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 Uh, I know that uh, a lot of people accidentally call it that. Yeah, this was a early 70s Spanish film that I had heard about for years. I actually think I had an Anchor Bay VHS. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting movie. What we have here is a newlywed, a newly, uh, a recently married couple. Right out of the gates, they go to... Uh, this hotel and the, the bride is ravaged immediately by someone. It's very bizarre. And, uh, they go to this mansion and, uh, 
you start to realize this family is not quite right. Uh, the wife starts to see this strange woman in the woods, and uh, the, the, she notices that none of the pictures, the portraits of the males, uh, the females, are actually uh, you know, hosted around the, the castle. It's only male pictures. So she finds them all in the basement and realizes that this, uh, this whole family lineage has a, a problem with the opposite sex, male and female. And she finds out that a previous ancestor who possibly uh, resembles Carmilla, who is uh, based on the old um, vampire novella that actually predates Dracula by 26 years, if you look it up, which is crazy, uh, is possibly killed her husband and uh, ran into the woods, and there's this elaborate story and her crypts there. So uh, the movie starts off fairly slow. It gets all that in, but there is some interesting imagery, and there's these weird kind of uh, uh, political motivations that the commentary talks about on here, which I really like seeing because it's uh, Sam uh, Sam and uh, Kate, Kate, Kat Ellinger, they talk about uh, a lot of the movies like this. This and uh, a lot of the inspirations, and a lot of the, how spl uh, Spain's uh, political climate was at the time, and uh, social uh, social norms and stuff at the time. So it, they 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 paint this as like a women's liberation uh, move, and, and and it's like that at times. But as it progresses and the ending comes, you're just like, oh my god, what's the message there? If that's the ending, the movie starts off so like I said, there's a lot of eroticism, a lot of nudity, a lot of uh you know uh, sex, uh, a lot of it kind of uh, disturbing to be honest at points because the husband is a sad uh, sadist a sadist uh, so that kind of gets a little uh, crazy and uh, there's some really good imagery the cinematographer did a great job they shoot in the mansion and on this beach and all the locations look great it's a 4k scan so it looks amazing in HD uh, I was really impressed with uh, uh, the actual release itself it had a bunch of stuff I'm uh, making of well an interview with the 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 lead actor in this, uh, I, Simon, I can't say his last name, so I'm not going to bother, but he's in a bunch of stuff. He's in the, uh, uh, what is it, uh, er Erika Kulai, or I can't say his name, uh, The Death Walks at Midnight and Death Walks at High Heels. He's in one of those, uh, maybe both of them. He's in a slew of stuff, some bigger movies as well. He's still alive, and he's still acting to this very day. But there's a two-part documentary, one about Blood Spattered Bride and one about his other career. Run the, together, they're about an hour. Uh, there's interviews on here with the author of uh, a bunch gothic uh, horror books about uh, gothic horror movies and he talks about the differences between American and European uh, horror films, uh, gothic horror films which is pretty unique and pretty cool I liked watching that, and uh, there was an interview with the DP who shed some light on the director, and uh, you know, there, there's some good stories in there uh, it doesn't seem like this director is the nicest guy or the best guy to work for um Besides that, I love the ending of this movie. Like it does start off slow, but the payoff is well worth it. It gets it gets insane, it gets intense, and it's one of the most memorable endings I've seen in a very long time. It's a very uh, unique Spanish film, and I, I think it's well worth your time. There's it's a slew of features. It looks good. It sounds good. Mondo Macabro knocked it out of the park with this one. Uh, like I said, a slow start, but a, a great ending makes up for it. Uh, and the slow the getting there is not horrible either. It's it's interesting stuff. So that's the blood spattered bride. Is that the woman in the portrait? How did she die? She didn't die. She was found spattered with blood, wearing a wedding gown, next to the body of her husband. She killed her husband on a wedding night. What? It's because he tried to make her do unspeakable things. Look, only the birth date is given. They waited for two years before they decided to bury her, but they never managed to take the dagger away from her hand. Nightmares are always the expression of a powerful desire which, instead of being accepted by us, is rejected and repressed. Did you hide the dagger under the pillow? No. She's lying. 
There exists in the human female an undeniable aggressive tendency when she is eventually confronted with the loss of her virginity. Quiet. Don't move. I love you. I don't hate you. I think you like it when he hurts you. I don't love you. I hate you. It is by no means uncommon in dreams to have thoughts of hatred and desires of revenge and death directed at the persons for whom in real life we feel the greatest affection. <laughs> to him, slash his face, find his heart and cut it out. Yes. There exists in the human female an undeniable aggressive tendency when she is eventually confronted with the loss of her virginity, an event of supreme importance to her and which is for her desirable and abhorrent at the same time. Some modern specialists call this the Judas Complex. Oh, uh, the next one here. Oh, boy. This was sent over by the sleaze box. Uh, Sean Donahue was nice enough to send me a copy. Uh, this is Necro Sluts. And I was thinking, uh, oh, what what am I getting myself into here? I don't think I can show the back there. But, uh, yeah. So I started this one. This is uh, The story about the movie is much more interesting than the movie. It's a lost movie. Uh, originally, it was made for Sub Rosa Films, but it was never put out. Never, ever put out. And uh, I'm hard-pressed to call this a movie, to be honest. It really is basically three scenes uh, put together. Uh, it's played as a found footage movie about a woman who commits an abortion and her and her boyfriend kind of eat and uh, eat the baby. That's the story. It's 49 minutes long. Every scene is drug out. It starts off with this girl kind of behind this. Uh, you know the um, videos they used to do where people would talk about being in a gang or talk about a crime and their voice. They were hidden behind a sheet and they would do the voice alterations and somebody would be asking them questions. That's about 33% of the movie. Uh, another 33% of the movie is cutting back to uh, the girl actually performing the uh, abortion uh, on herself. At first, uh, she kind of just has this coat. She's a coat hanger and she's sticking it in there for a long time and there's a blood pack spewing out and it lasts like 20 minutes and then it cuts back and then eventually the boyfriend's there hammering it up for the camera staring directly at the camera just doing this and letting blood drip it's repulsive it's not a movie to be honest it, it, if that interests you if that's something you're looking forward to you like really nasty sleazy stuff that doesn't really have a point to me and and the idea that it's a lost movie and srs uh sub rosa studios is like we're not putting that out we're not touching it that that might interest some people it's really gross. Uh, there's some up close uh, masturbation with a uh, coat hanger, you know, and uh, it's just uh, repulsive. And there's not really any features on there. I believe it was shot on video because I mean, it, it looks like it's shot on video. It, it looks the best the shot of video can look, I guess, on Blu-ray. But uh, it's just really nasty, and I don't really see the point to it. But I know that some people will enjoy this kind of thing. Not for me. Not my thing. Um, just did not particularly like it at all, and I can't give it a recommendation. But uh, if this is your kind of thing, then it's your kind of thing, and you'll know that just by seeing the... Uh, you won't see a trailer, because the trailer's probably too graphic to show. But you'll know if you want to see it or not. The next one here is Never Die Young. This was made in like 2013 and 14. This is by, uh, I believe he's French or Belgium. Um, this is a super weird movie. This is a hard press to call it a, a typical narrative as well. Well, maybe it's a typical narrative. It's a narrative story, but it's not told in a typical way at all. What we have here is this... Uh, it's just he's a he's a heroin addict and it goes through his his life as a young child and uh, he talks about his experiences and what happened to him all the way until he's an old man and uh, this is very bizarre because it's not told in like a typical fashion it's told in pictures and like what you would think are memories like this is a person thinking about all this stuff and it's told in weird imagery and stuff like that and a surreal imagery and uh, it's almost like they had a script and they basically went out and 
just shot all these things and narrated over it. It's, it's very experimental, but uh, it is kind of interesting and it doesn't really lose your attention. You want to see what happens to this character and the stuff that the character goes through is, is very crazy, very different. You got to get a look into, you know, a heroin addict's head a bit and, and realize that at, at points they were happy only when they had the drugs and what they would do for the drugs and uh, things like that. And it, it's just, it, it's a, uh, it's interesting, but it's also not really like a film. It's a film, but it's not like a typical straightforward at all. It's completely unique, and I'm just surprised they pulled it off and made it entertaining because, like I said, it's nothing like I've ever really seen before. It's very, it like, it's almost like a awful, awful poem of this guy's life, and he goes over it, and or somebody just rec uh, re, re, re like living their life uh, in one last moment. But it, it literally starts as a young kid, and he has so many, so many chances, and he's just not a likable character at all. Yet you still want to hear his story. Uh, and a lot of the times when uh, heroin addicts are portrayed in movies, I get very frustrated, very uh, annoyed, uh, or, or junkies, or people that are just not good people on top of being uh, addicts on top of uh, you know on top of it. So it's like you get very annoyed at these characters. But this character, for some reason, as bad as they were, or, um, they didn't. I didn't feel like they deserved to be a victim or anything. I was like, oh, they're not a victim because a lot of stuff they did to themselves. But I wasn't so angry at the character. I didn't want to hear what they had to say. And uh, some interesting things happen to this character. And uh, it, it also has that moment in uh, where he gets away with so much that he thinks he can do more and more and more. And the stuff that this character does get away with is, is pretty ridiculous. And, and you notice that a lot of uh, famous criminals, how they tell stories of what they got away with. And that's almost like a free pass to do more things like that. But uh, it, it has some nice imagery. Uh, especially shooting around, uh, you know, like the locations in Europe it was shooting at. They looked, they looked good. Although at the time they do go to like India or is it Thailand somewhere like, uh, they, they don't show. It's just still pictures of that. Cause you can tell, obviously there was some budget constraints there, but, uh, interesting movie. I, I don't know if I could recommend that to everybody, but, uh, it's very different, very unique. J'ai l'impression d'avoir fait la guerre du Vietnam. Sur les 100 copains que j'avais à l'époque, seuls trois sont encore vivants. Les autres sont morts d'overdose ou d'alcool, suicidés ou par accident. Famille Muller avait trois fils, Jem, Patrick et Jean-Marie. Tous les trois se sont shootés à l'héroïne. Jem, le plus âgé, s'est pendu en prison. Les deux autres sont morts d'overdose. Des familles comme ça, je pourrais en décrire des dizaines. C'était le jour qui précédait mes 17 ans. Deux agents de la Sûreté publique sont venus m'arrêter. Ils connaissaient tous mes trajets. Ils ont même trouvé des acides chez moi. Ils m'ont présenté au juge d'instruction pour vente de drogue. The next one is uh, uh, Shudder. I watched it on Shudder. It's called Dead Shack. It came out in 2017. It is a zombie f film, folks. So I know what you're thinking. Another zombie movie. Didn't you just review a zombie movie? Yes, I did. Or I'm about to. It depends where it ends up in this video. But uh, Dead Shack. Um... Yeah, the, the, the cover art on this one caught my attention. It looked bright. It looked uh, crazy. Had kind of like a Wormwood style going on just from the cover art. And I was like, okay, you know, I really liked Wormwood. I still like zombie movies as long as they're fun. But this one, uh, I put it on and it definitely has more of a, a scout's guide uh, in the or scouts versus zombies or scout's guide during the zombie apocalypse, whatever that movie's called. I like that one. I think it's really fun. But it has that kind of vibe where these, uh, this, these uh, a brother and sister and one of their friends and their father and his girlfriend are going to this... Uh, Law, this cabin in an isolated area. The dialogue is uh, obnoxious. It's ridiculous. But unlike most movies with this type of dialogue, it actually is funny. It made me laugh a couple times. The father is... 
He's an idiot, but he's great. He's funny. He's just everything you wouldn't want in a father. He's the kind of, hey, I'm the fun dad kind of guy. Makes a lot of inappropriate jokes with his kids. The kids make the same jokes. Uh, there's a good relationship between the three kids. Uh, the sister, who's kind of the tough one. The brother, who's kind of a jokester. And then their friend, who's kind of, uh, you know, hiding some things. And he's a little shy and whatnot. And this, of course, you know, he's going to have that character arc where he's brought out of the shell through all this horrible stuff. Most of the movie's played for laughs, but it does get horrifically gory at times. It looks good. It has a nice synth score, which I enjoyed. Uh, there's a good amount of splatter, to be honest. Some of it CGI. The CGI, eh, eh, it doesn't look great. But uh, the practical stuff is really good. Uh, the look of the zombies in the film is cool. Um, what we have here is a woman who's keeping her uh, zombie family hidden in this shack and feeding people to them. The kids stumble uh, across it, and of course there's a battle between the woman and the kids. She has this gnarly outfit, kind of like dressed in like leather and a motorcycle helmet, which is really cool looking. I like it. Uh... And like I said, it's got some good jokes, it's got some good gore, and uh, it's got some good fight scenes. I, li I like the shootouts, uh, the way the shotgun blast goes off, there's some slow motion in here of exploding stuff. The only weak part is, by the, by the second act, uh, the jokes don't land as well, they just kind of wear out their welcome, they're not as funny as they were. Uh... They managed to pack in some good-looking zombies, like I said, and it's got a lot of style. And uh, for a de uh, debut director, this is his first movie, I think it's really good work. I think it's really solid. I think it's really fun. And uh, it shows that zombie movies can still work. It's kind of like a cross between Scout's Guide to Zombies and Wormwood, if that uh, says anything to anybody with a synth score. And uh, it has a good atmosphere. There's snow and zombies, which I like seeing. I liked it. I think it's worth a recommendation, especially if you got Shudder. Uh, Dead Shack. Uh, cool stuff, cool stuff. Time for breakfast. So, guys, who's excited, huh? Camping trip? Going to a cabin? We're gonna act like rednecks or people who don't trust the government? So, Jay, not excited? Not really the camping type, Mr. Slade. We need to toughen up a little. Start with the Power Five, you know? Let's see it. Power five, like this. Come on. Come on. Power five, like that. We'll work on it. This place looks like a murder cabin. Yeah, seriously, Dad. It's the cheapest place that I could find on Craigslist, all right? I'm going to explore. Are you two coming? Sure, we'll go. Yo, check it out. This would be good for a LARP camp next week. Hey, dungeons and dildos. Let's keep moving. Guys, this is private property. Sweet. You scared of guard dogs or something? Guy. Can we please go? What? Dad, we gotta get the hell out of here. What you're saying is that our neighbor is a cannibal. Yeah. We gotta go then check this out. Hello? Oh, oh, I think when the blood's black, there's no going back. Okay, so what now? Let's gear up. It was a long I know what I want you to do. All right, guys, the next one uh, we're going to review was from uh, Netflix. We watched it on Netflix, I think. It was called The Ravenous. I believe it's called The Ravenous, not to be confused with the movie Ravenous, which came out years back. Uh, the Ravenous. It's a zombie movie. Surprise, surprise. I know how everybody loves zombie movies now. But uh, I watched a trailer in this, and I was like, man, that looks really freaking good. It didn't look like the typical stuff you see come out now where it's like, we're going to drain this movie of all color. Why? Because it looks like we want it to look bleak and oppressing. And it's like, come on, man. Leave the color in the damn movie. But uh, yeah, this is a typical zombie movie in a lot of ways. The setup is the same. Um, it starts kind of in the middle of the apocalypse. It doesn't start like right in the beginning. You don't see the beginning of it. 
you're following these uh these basically these characters trying to survive in the zombie apocalypse and the zombies are a little unique and it's done in a little of a unique way and it's in french and it's a different title in french yeah but i believe it i don't know it in french but i believe it's actually canadian it's I think French it's French Canadian. Canadian. It was yeah. shot in, it was, it takes place in Quebec, which is really interesting because we were watching, we're like, this is a French movie. I was like, this doesn't really feel like a French movie. It doesn't have like, I don't want to say this, but an air of pretentiousness. It did in a certain way, but it didn't. And uh, I was like, and then it was like, oh, it's from Canada. So it's kind of like that and kind of not. And it fit perfect. It definitely felt like a mixture of France and Canada or France and American filmmaking together. And uh, it made for an interesting movie. I like where it takes place at. It's mostly, uh, you know, farmland, farmland, which I really like seeing because I'm so sick of seeing zombie movies in the city. I like seeing them in the suburbs. I like seeing them in the farm farming area because there's something like obviously Night of the Living Dead, the farmland was so creepy and it works so well and you could set up so many good uh, scares that built up. Um, there's just a lot of unique things about this. The characters feel real and uh, every time somebody passes away or dies, I shouldn't say pass away, gets killed by zombies, uh, there's a moment where they all have like their, their moment. And uh, at first you're like, oh, this is really cool. But after a while you're like, okay, this is strange. But uh, the first one is such a great moment. These two friends, one is dying and they're talking. What would you do if you knew the, the end of the earth's coming? And they basically start making fun of each other's choices. Like, that's stupid. You're an idiot. And like one's dying and they're just staring up at the sky, which is like such a nostalgic thing to do because the sky is always the same no matter what age you are. So you get that memory when you see it. And it it's just a really beautifully done scene, I think, and really emotional. Uh, yeah, it had like and uh, like it was a really colorful movie, like you said. Yeah. Like the it like the the greens popped. The greens popped. Everything was like golden lit. Like it felt like a nice summer evening, not like yeah. late afternoon. Like it felt like you were outside in the summer, and like it, not enough horror movies take place actually in that kind of environment. It might not have been the summer because there's a lot of fog and stuff, but there's some a lot of interesting stuff that go on with the mm -hmm. zombies. They kind of place like a mo like the Stephen King book Cell. I've not seen the movie. I read the book years ago, but how the zombies seem to be interconnected in a way that they'll they'll let out this loud pitch screech, and the other ones will come running. And the zombies are weird. Like, they don't know if you're human or a zombie by staring. I don't exactly understand how they work, uh, how the infection works. You don't really ever grasp a lot of that. And they, they tend to take all these items and start stacking them. At one point, it's chairs. At one point, it's toys. At one point, it seemed like steel. Mm -hmm. And they stack them to the ceiling. And I was like, why are they doing that? Is that a place for all of them to see that, that statue and gather around it? Is that why they're trying to bring that? Or is it something else like more primitive, like we're dead and we're trying to build the staircase to heaven? I don't know. I don't really know. But my guess would be some sort of primitive uh, shrine that they all come to when they start building it. Yeah. It, to, yeah, it was pretty good. Um, the characters in it were amazing, the whole cast. Yeah, that's that's what I think one of the most interesting things is the characters in the cast. And uh, and they, they, they're, they all start off separated, but they all come together. And a lot of them have reason to be together. It's not just like, hey, although some are like, hey, we bumped into you and we're there. Mm -hmm. But they're the last survivors in this like town and and uh, or this uh, village, I'll say. But uh, you feel bad when people die. And uh, it tends to cut away right before they die or when the action happens in there. And it works for dramatic effect, but the movie doesn't shy away from blood or violence or gore. The zombies get shot, their heads explode, uh, goop, blood. And there's one point where a character completely loses it and pulls one of those moments where you always love seeing in a movie. Kind of like Hudson loses his mind in Aliens and he's just, come on, come on, and then and, uh, with a blade. And they are hacking and chopping a bunch of these things to pieces. And it, it's just a great scene. Yeah, there was a few times where uh, I I got a bit teary eyed, like and like not like like crying, but like like that's kind of touching. Like it's sweet, it's... and I legit feel bad for these people. It has like a lot of sentimentality in yeah. the zombie movie for some reason, but uh, it's good at showing things without saying it. Like right in the beginning, um, this woman gets out of the car and she kills a zombie, and you're like, okay, she did that, and then she sits down. And she looks out, and there's a kid zombie staring at her, and she just drives away. And I was like, "Oh, she lost a kid." And then it shows the, and then later it shows the back of her car seat, like an empty car seat. And I was like, "Obviously, she lost a kid." And that all that stuff comes out, uh, and you know later on, and, and they do that a lot with a lot of the characters. The lead character, he's not a heroic type, kind of like similar to like the movie I Am Hero, the zombie movie. He's not a heroic type. He shouldn't be a hero, but he's all they got, and he does a really good job. He's an interesting character, and. Uh, 
the end where he always tells these bad jokes is they set it up so good at the end and that's just and the, the little girl in this movie there's a little girl her facial expression she's top notch she's phenomenal everybody in this movie does a really good job it's just a really well made movie really well acted and uh, mm-hmm. although I think the pacing's not as good towards the end or the middle the middle yeah, and the, the pacing's middle. not good but the ending and the beginning are pretty the beginning has great pacing I thought yeah and I, I liked how there wasn't like a whole like we're arguing scene because yes. I hate those scenes in in zombie movies where like man's greatest enemy is man. E- well, you we know. know we know that's true. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> but but these guys we're just, we're just we're just like look we gotta do this we're doing this. So. Romero did it better. Yeah, you'll never do it better than Romero. So stop. Yeah, don't try to top the king. He did man is the word is is the enemy there. It's like you know like it's like that. Corny, the weather for and Walking Dead. It's like, they are the Walking Dead. It's like, okay, we get it. Wrap it up in two seasons. Right, thank you, <laughs> please. I'm not big on television in general because it's something that a zombie story can't go on for seven, ten seasons. It, it's so much better in a film presence to me. That's the way I am. Like, Day of the Dead, all the characters are introduced, and there's a, it just goes in. Dawn of the Dead, it's just epic, but it, it's just you can only go so long. You can only do the same thing so many times. You can only hit those beats and have them count so many freaking times. I think you got like a two-hour max for a zombie plot line, and you really aren't going to be able to expand upon anything further in it so i don't know i mean it, it depends on the zombie movie like dead shack or dead shack is a little interesting or wormwood these are fun like that's why zombie movies are fun somebody asked a question about comedy zombies and stuff too it's a lot of zombie comedies are like that because they they know that they gotta have fun with it and also talking uh, touching upon the arguing again yeah i like arguing in like the return of the dead style because they're it's frantic it's like oh my god it's yeah. just like it's realistic arguing and it's done in a comedic pace because when you freak out, it's funny from somebody on the outside. Like, my friends tend to laugh at me and make fun of me when I snap and get mad. Everybody laughs at your friend when they get mad. But, you know, some people don't. But then on the outside, if you're watching on the outside, it's funny. But if you're in it, it's not funny. You know, it's terrifying. And uh, that's why that like that movie works so well to me. But, uh, yeah, there's not these moments where they do get upset at each other. They say things. But it's not this uh, whole... I'm going to do something so dirty to you that it pits us against each other for the entire movie. And I don't know when Romero did it, it felt like it was natural. Like with Cooper and, uh, and Ben. Yeah. It just, it escalated and it felt natural and it was just, you know, I don't know. It's just, there's so much of this like really like crap that it's so dramatic at times. It just gets annoying. And this movie is very melodramatic in a lot of ways, but it works. It works. Yeah. The characters are good. That's why. And you care about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd really check it out. It's shot well, too. There's lots of beautiful imagery. Lots. It's shot in a great location. They take advantage of the woods. They take advantage of the wilderness. The blood looks really good, too. The gore looks good. There's lots of gore. Did you talk about that one movie you also watched yesterday? Uh, you can't talk about that. You can't talk That's about that. That's for a special episode. Okay. All right. Yeah, we're we'll definitely not talking about that. That's okay. for a future episode. A special thing we're work- I'm working on. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Anyways, The Ravenous. I would give it a recommendation. It's on Netflix. I hadn't heard anybody talk about it. Unless it must be brand new or something. I don't know. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what the French title was. El La Ravenos. Maybe. Did it begin with an A? I don't know. Can La... you look for it under Ravenous on Netflix? La Grey Boupon. Alright, that was probably racist. Is that racist? I don't know. I don't know. Scratch that from the record. I'm not scratching it, but it's under Ravenous. They're <laughs> so not going to put it under the French title. I don't know. They, they don't do? put the horde under La Horde. La Horde? Horde? Yeah. I don't know. I don't uh, know how to work Netflix. But it's not a PlayStation, so it's on PlayStation though. Regardless, you guys should check out uh The Ravenous if you're interested in uh zombie movies or a good, you know, drama or something. If you like a lot of these like Train to Busan and I Am Hero and stuff and you know, they're making some good zombie movies still. So, mostly of most of them are foreign, but yeah. Can we talk about Zelda? No. Je 
agenouillé sur le plancher de la cuisine, en train de focailler dans le ventre de la personne qui était meurtrie. Ailleurs que ce qui reste, c'est les premiers survivants que je croise depuis longtemps. On les voyait de moins en moins dans le coin. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé? Ils n'ont plus rien à manger. On est là, puis ils savent. The next one is the pick of the week. Or is it Bronson's back segment? Or is it the weekly western? I think I'll go with pick of the week and the weekly western. Let's go. Why not? Fill your hand, you son of a bitch! Say when. Chino. This is what uh, uh, James Grimmer picked for me to check out. Yeah, this is a French Blu-ray release. This is the only re really good release of this movie. I think that the United States releases look like crap. They're synergy and stuff. They're they're, they're just like uh, VHS rips. But Chino, this is a 1973 movie. This is one of, what, six or seven westerns that Charles Bronson did in the 70s, along with... Uh, uh, what are the other ones? He did uh, Shadow's Land, uh, which just shares a lot of similarities to um, Ten the Noon, um, Breakheart Pass. What's that one? Break? I can't think of that one. And there's a couple other ones, actually. Uh, Once Upon a Time in the West was the 60s. So, yeah, this is one of uh, White Buffalo. That's another one. But, yeah, Chino. This is an interesting Charles Bronson story. Uh, it follows Bronson, who's a horse breeder. He lives on this uh, property, and he has all these kind of wild horses that he brings in, and he breaks, and he trains them, and he breeds them. And they're Valdez horses. This is, I believe, based off a novel. And he takes great pride in what he does. And, uh, you know, Bronson's tough, stern, but he, uh, under that tough exterior, has a heart of gold. He takes in this, this young kid who's traveling, one of the Van Patten kids. Uh, I believe it's Tim, or is it... Uh, yeah, uh, actual relation to the Van Patten in class of 1984. There's a whole family of the Van Pans. But uh, he takes in this kid and uh, starts looking out for him. And uh, there's a rancher, a rich French rancher, the uh, French uh, lover in the uh, images by Robert Altman. He plays this kind of big uh, French rancher. And his, uh, 
his half sister, his stepsister, I'll say, is Jill Ireland, Charles Bronson's real life wife, and uh, she's English. And uh, Bronson and her start have a relationship, and you realize that Bronson's not well liked in the town. And of course, this leads to him getting in lots of fights. And those are pretty much the only scenes of action until the very ending. The fights are fun; they're cool. Watching Bronson break bottles over guys' heads, throw them out. Uh, sometimes they're played for a comedic, uh, you know, moment here and there. But of course, there's going to be turmoil between the French, uh, you know. Uh, rancher and Charles Bronson because the French rancher wants his property, doesn't want him talking to his sister. So there's this huge turmoil and it, it all builds up, you know, and, and like Mr. Majestic with Bronson, he just wants to do his thing and be left alone or death hunt. He just wants to be kind of left alone. And when you push Bronson, Bronson's eventually going to push back. And that's exactly what happens in Chino. Uh, Charles Bronson's pushed to the very, very limits uh, by the end of this movie. And in the last 10 minutes, there is a, a, a nice action set piece. And I, I do like how the movie ends. I think it ends in a... a it gets unrealistic, but it ends in a more realistic way than you would expect. Uh, I think that Bronson does a good job. I think that he shows the right amount of sensitivity with the kid and the storyline there. And uh, it's one of these movies that has one of those songs made for the movies, or maybe it was used in like kind of like Soldier Blue, which I don't know if it was made exactly for the movie, but you know it, it matches perfectly with the movie, and it has one of these songs like that in here, which I really liked. It o it opens and closes the movie. The disc itself is in full screen, but it does look like it's an HD master, and it looks fairly solid, I, and I'm sure better than anywhere else you're going to find it. I don't know if this disc is still in print, but uh, it does have a bunch of features on there. All in French. One that I would have loved to see that goes over all Charles Bronson's westerns from the very beginning and early stuff like Jubal and Vera Cruz and goes all the way to White Buffalo. So I was like, man, I wish I could watch this, but it's in freaking French. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting movie. It's a nice Bronson vehicle. I think that the relationship, you saw that tenderness and that toughness and Bronson's really good at doing that stern but fair kind of deal. And uh, I like him in this. Uh, and there's some jokes uh, at, you know, Jill Ireland's expense with Bronson and the kid and how they don't really know how to treat women it's a you know and uh stuff like that and it's definitely got that going on where it's it's very dated and like you know like kind of like a clint eastwood movie would be dated in that kind of way although i think sometimes clint was playing on those kind of things but uh yeah it's an interesting movie it's pretty damn good uh i would give it a recommendation especially if you like westerns especially if you like charles bronson I enjoyed it. Uh, I think it's good, and uh, I think it's solid, and I like the shootouts at the end, and a lot more to it. I like a lot more about it than just that. Celle-là, si je tombe sur elle, elle est sûre d'y passer. Woo! <laughs> 
You have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. Okay, we're going to do the pick a movie. Now, don't get confused if you want to ask a question or enter the pick a movie. It's still at the original link, the screaming toilet below. Uh, the basket case entry is a completely different uh, link, but you'll see it. And it will be below as well. You'll be able to find it. But uh, last week, who, who won? Was it uh, Christopher Dallier? And he wanted me to review a Roscoe the Embalmer, which I have reviewed years ago. But uh, it's been so long, I think I'll give it another watch and review it. Who's going to win this time? If you want to enter, just leave a comment and saying, uh, I want to be entering the pick a movie on YouTube, on Facebook, or on this link. We got John Wilhelm. It's always like the same like five, six people in here. So spread the word, man, if you want to see me review something. If you've ever wanted to see me review something. Uh, I enjoy doing it even with the five or six people. It freshens things up. It switches things up. Like Chino, that, that put that right at the head of the line. I wouldn't have watched that in a while, I don't think. But I'm glad. Uh, let's get into the Q&A. We have... Uh, some questions here. Christopher Dallier, what is your favorite Paul Nashy film? I'm going to be honest. I'm, I don't even know. I have tons of Paul Nashy movies, and I've had seen him maybe pop up in a couple, but none are really ringing a bell. You know, I haven't watched that many Paul Nashy movies, if any, all the way through. It's terrible. Which ones should I watch? I have both the uh, sets from uh, Scream. I had the old BCI set. I have a bunch of other BCI titles he's in. Uh, let me know which ones to watch. Uh, Nick, why do you think so many horror comedies feature zombies? And do you have any qualms about they overuse The Walking Dead? I love zombies, like I said. There's some bad zombie movies. I'm not a fan of the show Walking Dead, but I think that comedy can be very um, uh, used to any way, and uh, zombies can too. You can use zombies or comedies to do a lot of different things, so I guess that's the way they mix them. And, uh, any, and zombies can be funny. Any classic westerns you would love to make a retrospective documentary about? I'd love to see one. I don't want to make it, but I'd love to see one in depth uh, about Tombstone. Interviews with Kurt Russell, inter, uh, you know, the screenwriters, all the people. I know that the director has passed away, George P. Cosma, uh, Cosma, uh, Cosmatos, but uh, you know, maybe get interviews with the son who's a filmmaker. That would be great. There's tons of great actors in that. There's tons of scenes that were cut from that, from the script, from the movie. All these characters, these minor characters had big parts and if you look in the backgrounds and stuff you notice characters that are always in the background and then they have a death scene they might not have a death scene cowboys and then you know they're more important characters than you actually thought they were but they just don't have it like fuller and uh claiborne and uh who uh, uh pony deal there's just a bunch of those kind of characters that it's a very interesting uh movie and uh i love it but i i see the problems that it had with it now and i'm more interested in what happened on the set there John Wilhelm, if you could combine any two animals, like a shark and an octopus, was not sharktopus, for a horror sci-fi movie, what would it be? I think I would combine a monkey and a bat to get flying monkeys. Ooh, that's a good one. You know, it's always good to mix a praying mantis with something big. Uh, a prime mantis and a rhinoceros? How scary would that be? I'm trying to think something. A prime mantis and something amphibious would be absolutely terrifying. Like a prime mantis and an alligator or a crocodile? Crocodile, because they're meaner. That would be pretty scary. Or a dragonfly and a crocodile? Let's go swamp creatures. Anything from the swamp mix in, too. What about a crocodile and a frog? That would just be funny. But I could go on and on about those. Now let's hop into the update. Okay, let's hop into the update. What we have here is uh, a big order from Code Red, man. They had a sale, and I went nuts. This is Mortuary with Bill Paxton and uh, Christopher George. I've never seen this one, but yeah, it was. Uh, I've always wanted to. Let's see what we got there, all the features on there. But yeah, I'm interested in checking this one out, Mortuary. Then we got... Uh, Let's hop into, we got Silthus, finally. The Spawn of Silthus, also known as. Nice slipcover there. Uh, I have the DVD of this. Is it great? Not exactly. Is it fun? Yeah, it's fun. Is it one of the only, like, underwater creature movies uh, that looks like a creature from the Black Lagoon? Kinda, yeah. I love those kind of things. Also, he's made from garbage, so there's always that going for it. Then we have Gang Express. 
or Devil's Express. Sorry about that. AK Gang Express, I believe, actually. This is another code red one. Exit cover actually comes out. You can let's look at the back here. Not seen this one either, but I guess it's got zombies and kung fu. Last time I saw something like that was uh, Raw Force. Was it good? Not really. Was it entertaining? You're damn right. What do we got here? We got uh, Sweet Baby Charlie. Or am I going this way? Which way am I going here? I think it's this way. Sorry about that. AKA the Sadist. I mean, this is another one I wanted to see for years and never got to see it. Black and white movie. Uh, happy to see Code Red release. And I had the DVD. And this one, is it Atola? Atoli? Uh, this is a Jennifer Conley. Uh, and it's made uh, right after the Labyrinth, maybe before Phenomenon. Looks super interesting. I I'd never heard of this movie before they released it. Looked completely unique and different. That's actually a scorpion. Then we have uh, Night of the Cobra Woman, which was another uh, scorpion release here. What do we got going? That looked interesting. Good price. They had a buy five, get 50% off, so I bought more than five. Then we got Simon and the King of Witches. This is another one I had on DVD, never watched. A bunch of these, man. Just upgrading blindly. I need to watch these. Like Maybe one day I'll just watch every movie I own, but I doubt it. Uh, Warlock Moon, another one I had the DVD of and never watched. So, you know, I tend to do that, which is terrible. But uh, that's why I like to do the pick-a-movie, so people can see the collection and watch that now. Uh, we have Texas Detour and uh, Cuba Crossing. This I actually got in Hamilton Books. They had it on sale, a Blu-ray here, for 10 bucks. Couldn't pass that double feature up. We got some other ones here. We got uh, Devil Woman and Dragons Never Die. Another one from Hamilton Books, Code Red, 10 bucks. And then we got The House of Insane Woman and uh, Passion Plantation. Another $10 Code Red from Hamilton Books. And then we got some other ones. We got, uh, I wanted, I didn't have Pet Cemetery on Blu ray, and I was like, after watching that doc, man, I, I definitely want to revisit Pet Cemetery. Because I don't want to be buried in a pet cemetery. I don't want to live my life again. The Ramon song, guys. Uh, we have the uh, new uh, Vinegar Syndrome one, Baby Face 2. Look pretty cool. And we got uh, Welcome Home Charles and Emma May, director of penitentiary movies from Vinegar Syndrome. And we got Star Time, which, uh, you know, it's pretty cool to hear about it on the. Um, what was it the Scream uh, Scream Screamcast uh, podcast? And then they were they announced it was getting released. And uh, this is John P. Ryan in it, who I love from It's Alive and a bunch of other stuff. Best of the Best, uh, Avenging Force, Death Wish Four. And then we have Cemetery Without Crosses. This is an Arrow one, uh, trying to make up for my lost Arrow movies. But uh, that is the update. I really appreciate it. Go back to the video. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. And as always, you guys have a good one.